Заповедная страна, сколько древних тайн сокрыла она за хрустальную гору. Стерегут ее снега, да в обход ведут пути. В ту страну никто не смеет войти. Стерегут ее снега. За хрустальную горой заповедная страна, сколько древних тайн сокрыла она за хрустальную горой, сколько древних тайн сокрыла. За хрустальную гору. This film celebrates two preeminent 20th century figures, Nicholas Rurich, an outstanding artist and philosopher, and his wife, Helena Rurich, a formidable intellectual in her own right. They both dedicated their lives and efforts to a process we can call cosmic evolution. The couple embarked on an extremely challenging and difficult life mission to facilitate nothing short of a change in mankind's consciousness and to help humanity grow and reach higher intellectual and spiritual levels. Located in central Moscow, not far from the Kremlin and the famous Pushkin Museum, this 17th century mansion is a historical site in its own right. It has a rich and interesting history. Today it's home to the Nicholas Rurich Museum and International Center of Rurichs. A unique collection of art and artifacts, not to mention cultural and educational activities, has made the museum famous far beyond the borders of Russia, both in the East and West. The entrance to the museum is marked by a bronze plaque listing the names of its four founders. Svetoslav Rurich, Lyudmila Shapushnikova, Yuri Vorontsov, Boris Bulochnik. There would have been no museum without the invaluable contributions of these four people. Each of them was of paramount importance to the project's success. Svetoslav Rurich made a priceless donation of the unique works of his parents, Nicholas and Helena Rurich. These comprise the main body of the museum's collection. Lyudmila Shapushnikova tirelessly led the organizational work to success throughout the troubled 1990s and helped officially establish the museum. Yuli Vorontsov a distinguished Russian diplomat and former ambassador to India helped move the Rurik heritage from India to Russia. Boris Bulochnik, a banker and one of Russia's very first patrons of the arts, provided all-round financing for the museum. Let's step inside the museum and go up the historic staircase designed by the prominent 18th century Russian architect 
Matvei Kazakov. The museum consists of a number of halls. The introductory hall. The St. Petersburg Hall. The Russian Hall. The Living Ethics Hall. Master's Hall. The Central Asian Expedition Hall. Kulu. The Banner of Peace Hall. of Yuri Rurik, the family's elder son and renowned Orientalist. And the Hall of Svetoslav Rurik, the younger son and artist. The exhibition encompasses every aspect of Nicholas and Helena Rurik's life and heritage. It constitutes a single place that brings together and presents the multifaceted creativity of this great family. Art, philosophy, spiritual quests, scientific research and wide-ranging philanthropic endeavors. Nicholas Rurik's graduation from the St. Petersburg Academy of Arts marked the beginning of his long and illustrious artistic career. In 1897, Nicholas Rurik created his first piece. He called it The Messenger. He proceeded to paint a series of historical works each was themed around the distant past. They had a special aura about them, which distinguished them from historical paintings by other artists. They looked so vibrant and vivid, as if their subjects had actually sat for Nicholas Rurik. Actually, it's off the mark to say, as if, because Nicholas Rurik really did see what he captured so vitally on canvas. His paintings were as alive and real as the visions he had. I'd like to refer to what the writer, Leonid Andreev, once said about Nicholas Rorich. I think it captures him the best. 
Andreev said that Rorich makes the invisible visible. It means that Rorich had the ability to get in touch with worlds comprising other states of matter and manifest them as images as materially dense as planet Earth itself. His visions, dreams, and subtle intuition provided him with the information that he channeled and shaped into his art. This special ability not only predefined Nicholas Rurik's unique artistic achievements, but his entire life path. Between 1904 and 1911, Nicholas Rurik created three enigmatic paintings that his contemporaries found impenetrable and impossible to understand. The first of these was The Treasure of the Angels. What confounded the viewers was the painting's unusual style and imagery. It seemed to unite both mythology and religion code for conveying some very important and necessary knowledge. This centers around the rock in the picture, which looks very much like a meteorite. The rock has some mysterious connections with the medieval tales of the Holy Grail, the Knights of the Round Table, and Parzival. The treasure of the angels was followed by the saintly visions. Before completing the painting, Nicholas Rurik made a preliminary study. It depicts two figures dressed in identical dark colored flowing robes, later painted with much greater detail. The two look as if they're about to exit through the door but something has just stopped them. Rurich later wrote, These images appear very vague in my dreams. These signs and where they go are hard to uncover and capture in reality. The final work of the three was called The Dove's Book. Here, Rurich used the reverse perspective technique, typically used in Byzantine and Russian Orthodox icons, depicting otherworldly places. The Dove's Book itself lies in the foreground, like a cover concealing the deep meaning in this remarkable painting. All three were symbolic paintings and, regrettably, were misunderstood by Rorich's contemporary audience. They did not know how to interpret them. Some speculated that Rorich was misguidedly departing from real painting to iconography and so on and so forth. But in fact, these three paintings defined the depth and breadth of nothing less than our planet's evolution. Before the outbreak of World War I, Nicholas Rurik created a series of prophetic paintings foretelling the tragic events that shook the world. However, these paintings were also largely misunderstood, or not understood at all, by contemporary audiences, just as the three before them had been misconstrued. The burning sky and land conjure a terrifying backdrop for the appearance of the last angel. Fires rage and devour the city's walls, towers and churches. Bitter condemnation is in the angel's eyes beholding the scene. In the messenger, a sailing ship with its sails down is approaching the high fortified walls of a town. The outline of its masts resembles crosses over graves in a cemetery. Its appearance is disturbing. Only one man in the town, who's viewing the ship from the walls, feels the menace. Human deeds, 
An empty, pitch-black sky hangs low, stifling life's very breath. Smoke is rising over a defeated town that's falling away in the dreadful distance. The skyline is broken and surreal. In the foreground, a group of nine is standing on a hilltop. They are dressed in unusual robes and have a biblical appearance. The meaning of Rurik's The Crowns remained unclear for some years. Three kings in the foreground and three crown-shaped clouds floating away did not make sense until revolutions and wars had swept away three royal families. The Habsburgs, Hohenzollerns and Romanovs. In the summer of 1914, World War I broke out. During its course, it claimed millions of lives and dramatically reshaped the world. At that time, the Ruriks with their sons Yuri and Svetoslav were in Finland, which was then still Russian territory. In 1918, Finland proclaimed its independence and closed its borders with Russia. The Ruriks found themselves cut off from home. They now turned their thoughts and hopes to India, which was the home of the great teacher. It was the land that called them in troubled and uneasy times. I kneel before the gurus of India, wrote Rurik later, for they introduced a true spirit of art and joy and a serene creative silence into the chaos of our lives. They called us when we needed the call the most. They summoned us confidently, quietly, and powerfully with their infinite wisdom and knowledge. Soon when all the evil of the massacre and pillage of recent years fades away, our future will be shaped by a spirit of true knowledge. When they left home, the Ruriks didn't think they would ever see Russia again. Ahead was a long journey full of surprises and challenges. Before Rurik and his family reached India, they visited Britain, the United States and France. It was in Britain that Helena Rurik met the teacher for the first time. Not long after this, the teacher started telling Helena Rurik about a philosophy of cosmic reality called living ethics. Living ethics was an impulse of cosmic evolution designed to help humanity develop new ways of thinking and evolve to a level of cosmic mentality. It was wisdom that revealed deep connections that exist between the universe and humanity and the laws that define the course of evolution. At about the same time, a remarkable finding was made in France whose significance was greater than it had first appeared. 
A delivery made to a bank in Paris contained a piece of a meteorite that had come to the Earth from the distant Orion constellation. This finding helped reveal the true meaning of Rurik's painting, The Treasure of the Angels. And so, as Nicholas Rurik was making his way to India, the symbols in his pictures miraculously manifested themselves in reality. It became clear that saintly visions had predicted the Rurik's first meeting with their teacher. The treasure of the angels had prophesied the discovery of a meteorite with truly unique energy, and the mythical Dove's Book had anticipated living ethics. Thus, the prophecies of these three paintings were fulfilled, and as such, predetermined the entire future of the Rurik family. In 1923, the Ruriks arrived in India. In India, they began their real life's work as messengers of cosmic evolution. The inspiration and blessing for this undertaking came from the great teacher, who they met near Darjeeling, a town in the Indian state of West Bengal. Here is how Nicholas Rurik recalled their first encounter. The four of us were making our way through the mountains in a motor car one afternoon. Suddenly, our driver slowed down. We saw four men in grey robes carrying a palanquin, in which a llama was sitting. He had long black hair and, quite unusually for llamas, a black beard. He was wearing a crown on his head, and his yellow and red robes were strikingly clean and fresh. As we passed each other, the Lama greeted us by nodding several times. We couldn't help thinking about him long after we had left him behind. We started to make inquiries about him, hoping to meet again. To our great surprise, the local Lamas told us there was no such Lama in the area that they knew of. This event had a dual nature. One was the obvious, material side, while the other was of a spiritual nature and thus held great meaning for the life-changing meeting that was yet to occur. The man in the palanquin was one of the great teachers on his way to a meeting with the Ruriks in a small roadside temple. This temple, located just outside Darjeeling, was quite unusual. Its domes resembled those of a mosque. But the walls were adorned with images that belonged to many different religions. A freshwater spring by the temple was also an object of worship. When I approached it, I noticed two figures. One represented Krishna, a traditional sculpture in Hinduism. The other was Buddha, the founder of Buddhism. This temple combined elements of various religions and together they produced a sensation of peace and harmony. 
It felt like they all belonged together. Seeing them next to one another didn't seem incongruous. In fact, the religions represented different stages in the spiritual evolution of our planet. And through that, it was clear they had much in common. What did they talk about when they finally met? I'm referring to Rorik's actual words on the matter. One thing they really focused on was the Central Asian expedition. At that meeting in a small roadside temple, both the goal and the actual route of the expedition were defined. The five-year Central Asian expedition that lasted from 1923 to 1928 became the Rurik's principal contribution to cosmic evolution. It started in Sikkim, progressed through Indian Kashmir, Ladakh, and China's Xinjiang, with a detour through Siberia to Moscow, and then eastward to the Altai Mountains, Mongolia, Tibet, finishing back in Sikkim. All these areas were homes to ancient and very rich cultures. Casual observer, the Rurik Central Asian Expedition would have looked like any other. The expedition members collected various samples and artifacts and explored new routes. They came to interesting conclusions over the most likely patterns of the migration of peoples and the significance of nomadic cultures in the history of the East and West. The expedition also encountered predictable difficulties such as the harsh winter which caused delays on the Changthang Plateau in Tibet. There was also the interest of the British intelligence service that followed the expedition, as well as the suspicions of the Soviet intelligence services to contend with. However, there were also things that made this expedition entirely unique. First and foremost, it produced an unprecedented number of outstanding paintings. This wasn't simply a result of Nicholas Rurik's desire to capture the beautiful sights he observed. There was much more to it, and it was very subtle. 
it wasn't quite on the surface, a mystery that was yet to reveal itself. While in Sikkim, Rurik painted a series of pieces under the umbrella title of His Land. Each of them featured India's highest peak, an object of devout worship, Kanchenjunga. Here we see two wanderers taking a break. They're sitting on a rock looking at a pearl rosary. This work is called the Pearl of Searching. In Remember, a man on a white horse is seen leaving his home in the mountains. He seems to be telling the woman he's leaving behind, Remember. Here, depicted in lower than the depths, is the dark silhouette of a contemplative man about to enter a mountain cave. The entrance is glowing mysteriously, with no visible source of light. In the fire blossom, a bloom of fire in the nighttime is emerging from the depths of a mountain. A procession of people in long white robes steps out of a cave in the mountains. The leader is carrying a mysterious box that emits a mystical light into the surrounding gloom. This is the burning of darkness. In Chintamani, a saddled, albeit riderless horse is carrying a similar box of emerging flames. A caravan of weary pilgrims continues its journey into the night as Venus appears, the sky's brightest heavenly body which bathes them in a blue light. This painting is the star of the mother of the world. He who hastens captures a hurrying rider making his way through the mountains on an important errand, possibly carrying a message. The sun is rising and he's spurring his horse along desperate to arrive on time. In higher than mountains, a gravity-defying llama floats in the sky above mountain peaks that resemble islands in a sea of clouds. In the Book of Wisdom, a man reads a mysterious text in solitude. His land depicts a land that was once real and unreal. It was as if an invisible and enlightened power was coordinating everything that the people did in this place and set them sacred goals they were committed to achieving. After he came into contact with India's teachers, the Mahatmas and great souls, Nicholas Rurik himself and his art were transformed. New and enhanced levels of energy enabled Rurik to produce paintings of rare calm and serenity, even though he was constantly on the move and dealing with the rigors of camp life. The very trail that the expedition followed supplied high levels of energy. The great souls themselves had passed along it. Rurik was receptive to this energy and captured it in his paintings. After his land, Nicholas Rurik completed another series of paintings under the title Banners of the East. It was dedicated to the great spiritual guides who've been the custodians of our planet's cosmic evolution through different epochs. Among these works were Buddha the Conqueror, Signs of Christ, Muhammad on Mount Hera, Moses the leader, Padma Samhava, Sergius the builder, Confucius the just one, the watch on the Himalayas and others. The series was crowned with the painting, Mother of the World. Nicholas Rurik's visions provided the sole source of inspiration for these paintings. 
nothing he saw during the expedition could have supplied this visual material. The final series of paintings produced by Rurik during the expedition was Maitreya. It conveyed the ideas of a new epoch of evolution that humanity was yet to aspire to. The series opens with the painting The Great Horseman or The Advent of Shambhala. Shambhala was the mythological name of a real location where the great teachers, also called cosmic hierarchs, were believed to have actually lived on Earth. The painting's style resembles the Buddhist genre of Tanka, whose traditional motifs included the figure of a horseman, a warrior of light. Maitreya the Conqueror presents the coming Buddha as a cloud horse rider arriving with the sunset. The remarkable paintings Nicholas Rurik created with his unique energy during the Central Asian expedition have been attracting the attention of artists, researchers, philosophers and politicians ever since. We can say that in the 20th century Rurik's art was viewed by many people as unique and without precedent. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first Prime Minister and one of the greatest leaders of the new independent India, wrote the following about Nicholas Rurik's paintings. When you look at these paintings, so many of them of the Himalayas, you can catch the spirit of these great mountains which have towered over the Indian plains and been our sentinels since time immemorial. They remind us of so much in our history our thought, our cultural and spiritual heritage. It is not just to do with India's past, but something that is permanent and eternal about India. And we cannot help feeling a great sense of indebtedness to Nicholas Rurik, who has enshrined that spirit in these magnificent canvases. Contemporary literary critic and poet Barnard Conlon defined the essence of Rurik's works as follows. If Phidias was the creator of divine form and Giotto the painter of the soul, then Rurik may be said to have revealed the spirit of the cosmos. New Age Press wrote this about him. Rurik was a great soul. His consciousness was cosmic in nature and his spirituality was the main source of his creative power. Biraswar Sen, one of India's leading painters, was very appreciative of Rurik's legacy and one couldn't agree more with his words. To most of us, Rurik is a legendary figure of romance. Against the wild glare of the flaming west, his mighty figure looms large like the motionless and benevolent Buddha in the midst of a vast cosmic cataclysm. Far above the tumultuous din of frenzied nations rings his voice, the unequivocal commandments of the eternal, the voice of truth, beauty and culture. This is the person who was charged with a highly important evolutionary mission on the journey of the Central Asian expedition. The mission was closely connected to the great cosmic law in evolution the higher promotes the lower. The fact of the matter is, all energetic processes conducted by higher cosmic matter on Earth must have a higher vibration than our energy. Otherwise, there will be no development, no evolution. But the higher must give us a mechanism for the lower to move further in the evolutionary process. And the Central Asian expedition contributed a lot to this mechanism. This energy mechanism was called the laying of magnets. These are not your average magnets, but rather energy structures in space. To build or lay one, you need a strong source of energy. On the Central Asian expedition, 
the travelers had three sources. The first was a meteorite, which had what we call high vibration or fiery energy. The second source was Helena Rurik, with her regular energy turned into fire. The third source was the paintings Nicholas Rurik created in Central Asia, in spite of all the difficulties along the way. His works reflect the strong vibration that he felt in the air during the entire expedition. According to the philosophy of cosmic reality, such a magnet is capable of translating the idea of space into action. It is this action that spearheads evolution and elevates the planet to a new evolutionary level, changing the consciousness of humanity. But what kind of action are we talking about? The answer is an action toward greater evolution. There are more than enough ideas of space in the cosmos, and all human knowledge is based on these ideas. It translates an idea of space into action. So with these magnets on the Central Asian expedition, the route turned into a channel of evolution, so to speak, bringing to the cosmos what the Earth needs. The laying of magnets made the Central Asian expedition a milestone of creativity in cosmic evolution. There was also another thing that made the Rurik's trip very special as distinct from any other 20th century expedition. It seemed as if there were some underlying secret path. All along the way, the Ruriks met a series of bizarre people who brought mysterious messages and impressed them with their actions. There were lamas, storytellers and fellow travelers. At every stage of the journey, in each country and area, something outstanding would happen. Something that required decrypting and interpreting. The Rurik's diaries hold many unusual stories. Put together, they give a unique picture of the internal story of the expedition, so unlike that of the exterior. Years passed before it became clear that the secret path was actually the guidance of the teacher, helping those who move along the complicated path of cosmic evolution. The expedition also raised the issue of a new science and a new learning paradigm and the Ruriks elaborated on it in the context of the philosophy of a cosmic reality. Not only did living ethics contain a new learning paradigm in accordance with cosmic mentality, but it also paved the way for new developments in science itself. The new paradigm sought to synthesize science and metascience. In other words, experimental and spiritual knowledge obtained as part of cosmic evolution. This helped to tap into a source of ancient wisdom based on both the theoretical findings of the East and the empirical discoveries of the West. Progress in art and religion, philosophy and science all came together in a holistic picture of the universe. Elena Rurik wrote, Modern science is moving in quick steps towards all the great truths formulated in Oriental philosophy and religions, and soon, very soon, they will meet and stretch their hands out to greet each other. The Ruriks then left Darjeeling for the Kulu Valley in the West Himalayas, where they later founded the Urusvati Institute also known as the Himalayan Research Institute. 
its name translates as the light of the morning star. For many reasons, Kulu turned out to be the perfect place for an institute of this nature. The Ruriks decided to stay there. This extraordinary and mountainous valley harbored many ancient monuments and a rich history. But of paramount importance was the fact that the teacher himself had indicated this place and it was the reason they decided to start the institute here. From the very outset, the methodology of a new science was formulated in Urusvati. The institute opened new departments that united different branches of knowledge. The Department of Archaeology included sub-departments for world history, the history of Asian cultures, the history of ancient art, and linguistics. The domain of the Natural Science Department was Botany, Zoology, Meteorology and Astronomy. Among other things, it studied rays from space appearing high up in the mountains. The Medical Department concerned itself with traditional Tibetan medicine and pharmacopoeia. It also boasted a biochemical laboratory that worked on cancer treatments. All the members of the Rurik family participated in the efforts to launch the Institute and make it work. The Institute cooperated with a number of prominent scientists, scholars, artists and polymaths worldwide and involved them in its projects. The Ruriks enjoyed the closest cooperation with prominent Indian scientists, scholars and artists, including Sir Chandra Shekhara Venkata Raymond, Sir Jagadish Chandra Bose, Rabindranath Tagore, Abanindranath Tagore, Suniti Kumar Chatterjee, and Savapali Radhakrishnan. Among their Western colleagues and advisors were Robert Andrews Millikan, Albert Einstein, Albert Abraham Mitchelson, Louis de Broglie, and the famous traveler and explorer Sven Hedin. There was Professor Serge Metalnikov from the Pasteur Institute in Paris. Also the author and Oriental Studies scholar Charles Landman and many others. Before he was arrested, the famous Soviet botanist and academic Nikolai Vavilov used to exchange letters with Svetoslav Rurik on genetics and plant cultivation. Scientific experiments and tests confirmed the spiritual knowledge accumulated in the Himalayas. It was at Yurzvati where the first studies into subtle energy, magnetic currents, cosmic radiation and alternative states of matter were conducted. All the research, theory and experiment in this truly unparalleled center was based on the idea that much of earthly phenomena originates in outer space and other worlds connected on a higher plane of energy. The Institute pioneered the science of the future. The Urusvati Institute must develop into a city of knowledge, noted Helena Rurik. Our aim is to produce a synthesis of scientific achievements in this city. That is why all branches of science must be represented in it. And since knowledge has the whole cosmos as its source, the participants in scientific exploration must come from the whole world, that is to say, all nations. Furthermore, just as the cosmos is indivisible in its functions, the scientists of the whole world must be indivisible in their achievements. In other words, united in the closest collaboration. However, there very soon came a time when not only this city of knowledge, but even further development of the Institute itself became unrealistic. The world economic crisis of 1929 to 1933 interrupted the financial backing of Vurusvati, while World War II made it impossible altogether. Ever since, the Institute has been on hold.
The next evolutionary move, according to the teacher's plan, was an international agreement called the Rurik Pact. Its aim was to protect cultural and historical monuments during war and peacetime. It was back in 1931 that the Rurik started working on the draft of the pact, when the Second World War was a dark shadow looming ahead. The cultural heritage of the world, as the spiritual basis for humanity's cosmic evolution, was to be protected from damage. The pact was supported by the US President, Franklin Roosevelt, and the Latin American states. Both Europe and the USSR refused to sign the agreement, and it was they who suffered the greatest cultural losses and damage during the war. President Roosevelt regarded the Rurik Pact as a treaty of major importance. In presenting this pact for signing by all countries, we are striving for its world acceptance and that it becomes a vital principle for preserving modern civilization. This agreement has far more profound spiritual significance than the text of this document. Rurik proposed a symbol, the Banner of Peace, which would identify objects to be protected under the terms of the pact. The symbol had three smaller circles within a big circle that represented eternity. The three circles stood for the past, the present and the future. The banner of peace with its symbolic content was closely connected with cosmic evolution. The Rurik Pact is a very noble initiative. It was started by a person of high moral and cultural integrity. Somebody who felt very strongly about culture and wanted to do his best to preserve it in the world. As a diplomat, I have always been strongly impressed that it was put forward by Rurik alone, not a country, a government, or a group of governments. It was all the idea of one man, who had invested colossal efforts to promote and implement it. This was around the time when Nicholas Rurik commenced work on his series of prophetic paintings. In 1931, he painted Flowers of Timur. The fires on the watchtowers warn of an impending cataclysm, spurring the rider in full armor to saddle his horse. In 1936, Rurik's Armageddon predicted the course of history. An ancient city set ablaze and its fleeing people foretell what was to happen later in Europe. Burning cities destroyed by bombing and droves of directionless refugees. An unanticipated follow-up was the hero of a Russian epic tale, Sviatogor. He has a portentous quality and looks as if he were about to perform some great feat. Sviatogor became a Russian landmark in the prophetic series. A second Armageddon appeared in 1940. We see smoke over the burning rooftops of homes and the sky reflects crimson flashes of fire. This Armageddon clearly pointed to a war that was threatening Russia. Messenger from the Himalayas indicates the place the warnings were coming from. Chronologically, it's followed by The Heroes Awaken. In a vast and hidden cave, Russian heroes in helmets and heavy armor wake up to the first rays of sunshine and repel the first attack. A message to Tiron recounts the legend of someone who carelessly discarded a message of a deadly threat and lost his life. Early in 1941, Rurik created the blind man. Trapped in an old city, a man flails around like a caged animal, 
failing to understand what is going on and where he should go. Unwittingly, he draws closer and closer to burning homes where flames are flickering and sparks are popping. And finally, there's the unique and tragic beauty of Gesa Khan to defy your imagination. The sky is so redolent of scarlet that it's hard to tell whether it's a reflection of flames or simply the blood-red sunset. This is a terrifying background against which the small silhouette of a rider is braced for action. He's pulling back his bowstring, about to send his arrow to the people as a message of an inexorable and impending disaster. The whole series was a pre-war apocalyptic warning. However, no one at the time in Russia took the warning seriously. And no one believed the reports from Soviet intelligence, diplomats or insiders in the Wehrmacht. On June the 22nd, 1941, German troops crossed the Soviet border and started a long and cruel war. the 
хрустальною горою. This film celebrates two preeminent 20th century figures, Nicholas Rurich, an outstanding artist and philosopher, and his wife, Helena Rurich, a formidable intellectual in her own right. They both dedicated their lives and efforts to a process we can call cosmic evolution. The couple embarked on an extremely challenging and difficult life mission to facilitate nothing short of a change in mankind's consciousness and to help humanity grow and reach higher intellectual and spiritual levels. Located in central Moscow, not far from the Kremlin and the famous Pushkin Museum, this 17th century mansion is a historical site in its own right. It has a rich and interesting history. Today it's home to the Nicholas Rurich Museum and International Center of Rurichs, a unique collection of art and artifacts, not to mention cultural and educational activities, has made the museum famous far beyond the borders of Russia, both in the East and West. The entrance to the museum is marked by a bronze plaque listing the names of its four founders. Svetoslav Rurich, Lyudmila Shapushnikova, Yuri Vorontsov, Boris Bulochnik. There would have been no museum without the invaluable contributions of these four people. Each of them was of paramount importance to the project's success. Svetoslav Rurich made a priceless donation of the unique works of his parents, Nicholas and Helena Rurich. These comprise the main body of the museum's collection. Lyudmila Shapushnikova tirelessly led the organizational work to success throughout the troubled 1990s and helped officially establish the museum. Yuli Vorontsov a distinguished Russian diplomat and former ambassador to India helped move the Rurik heritage from India to Russia. Boris Bulochnik, a banker and one of Russia's very first patrons of the arts, provided all-round financing for the museum. Let's step inside the museum and go up the historic staircase designed by the prominent 18th century Russian architect Madvey Kazakov. The museum consists of a number of halls. The introductory hall. The St. Petersburg Hall. The Russian Hall. The academic and art team that has established itself there over the years carries on the priceless cause of the Ruriks, one that is closely tied to cosmic evolution, cosmic mentality and the new learning paradigm. These days, the struggle of light against darkness is extremely hard to carry on with. But they have understood, in spite of anything, that a new epoch of cosmic mentality will inevitably emerge on the Earth. The Rurik Pact exhibition has appeared all over the world. Today, amid armed conflicts and the destruction of priceless legacies of human culture all over the planet, it's more relevant than ever. Thousands of people have seen the exhibition in the United States, Austria, Bulgaria, Germany, Italy, Mexico, India, Mongolia, Belgium, France and many other countries. Cosmic evolution is expanding throughout the globe based on the work of the Rurik's successors and their teachers' ideas. This valuable work is carrying on today at a time when our planet is crying out for new approaches, new ideas, and a new science. In short, 
a new cosmic mentality. It was written by Lyudmila Shapushnikova. The assistant writer was Pavel Zhuravichin, and the academic consultant was Viktor Frolov. This film was produced by the International Center of the Rurics.